first is provide um, just maybe five to seven minutes for each of our guests to respond to uh, what they've heard tonight and what they've read and what they've gone over and their thoughts and reactions, and then we'll engage in a brief conversation. So uh, Dr. Harris, we'll start, with, we'll start with you. Thank you for being with us tonight, all the way from Biola. Thank you very much. It's not that far. <laughs> hey, hey, I drive from there. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. Well, no, I, I number one, I, I just want to say I'm grateful uh, for the for the invitation. I'm grateful for Dr. Clark for for asking me. I really really appreciate it. Um, and of course, the correspondence. Um, so I, I had a chance to to read the book, and and I consider myself a professional theologian because they pay me. Um, so, but I, I enjoyed the book. So what what I I did I I. Took, looked at it through a theological lens because yes. yes. that's what I do. Yes. I can't help myself. Yes. So I, I, I looked and I, I made these connections with the students, how the students, they, they, they how can I put it? From a, a pneumatological sense, mm -hmm. it, it seems like the students use this, this pneumatological thrust where, where the, for me, the Holy Spirit just, just awakens them. There's an epistemological awakening mm -hmm. in them and, and, and that they re recognize that we have the right to be here. Not only do we have the right to be here, the same God that created you created me. So something was stirring to them. So what I did appreciate was that, I, I love that, that Shabazz Center that, that you mentioned, because it seems to me one thing, and I got this from the guy I studied, Colin Gunton, by the way, and he has this sense of a particularity, but particularity for him included love and freedom. And, and not only freedom for yourself, but freedom for the other. Mm. And so the, the students, what I noticed, they somehow learn it's one thing for me to be free, yeah. but I need to free the others as well. I need to free my, my brothers and sisters in the neighborhood. Yeah. I need to free my brothers and give them access to this space as well. So I, I noticed that, I, I, so I appreciated that. Yeah. And I appreciated the, the, the way the spirit seems to to excited their imagination, that, that excited their imaginations that for me, it was sort of a, this is an opportunity for things like the Shabazz Center and things like the um, African American Association. I forget the, the letters, but the point is they were now able to participate with the work of the Holy Spirit to self-define who they are, mm -hmm. yeah. self-determine who they yes, are yes, in yes. cooperation with the Spirit's work. So I, I saw that all the way through that, and I, and, I, and I looked at it like, this is a good model for us. This is a good model for what we have to do as, as a people on our campuses and, and as a faculty member, that we participate in this, this self-determination of, and, and here, here, here it is for me too. I looked at it through an eschatological lens. And, and let me explain what I mean by that. I mean by that from an eschatological lens that they were fulfilling the great commission of God of creating a people group out of all nations, tongues, language, and people. So in other words, all these Ivy League schools, you need me. Yeah. You yeah. need yeah. us in order to fulfill God's divine purpose yeah. for creation. Yeah. You need us not to assimilate. Right. You need us to be who we are yeah. because... You need us to be who we are, who Christ has called us to be right. as that right. particular people right. group. Right. And that's pneumatological for me because yeah. the Holy Spirit is the, the spirit of, of liberation, the spirit of love, but the spirit of also particularity. Yeah. So I need you. I'm talking in the voice of God. Forgive me for that. That was probably kind of <laughs> kind of a little heretical. But, um, <laughs> you know, you have a tendency to do that when you're a friend of your students. You, yeah, you, yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, <laughs> just for just for thirty minutes in front of the class. Yeah, so so it's almost as if God is saying, "I need these people to yes. be who I call them to yes. be in Christ, yes. and let them to define who they are, self determine who they are in that time, yes. in that place." And so I, I read the book and I said, "Wow, this is what they're doing." Yes. Now, 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 obviously, uh, 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 
Dr. Bradley here wasn't writing uh, for theologians. <laughs> but to me, I, I just looked at that and it was self-evident that it was clear. If you can read between the lines and look at it theologically, I, I just saw the, the, the work of the, the spirit working there. And like I said, uh, uh, pneumatologically liberation towards love, pneumatologically the eschatological spirit of making it particularly who they are. Um, so I, I saw all that and I, I, I saw I appreciated the work. And, and without that God driven, God initiated manifestation of that part of the Imago Dei or the, right, of right. the kingdom of God, there was a, a, an image that was there, but it was lacking. Yeah, yeah that's right. That's there right. was a portion right. of, of the kingdom being demonstrated there, but not a full that's right. Manifestation. That's right. Awesome. Thank so it, you. It, it's that, and, and I think you had a conference here uh, several years ago of let me help you save yourself, so to speak, because <laughs> you are still um, um, participating in the strictures that are preventing my humanity. So let me rescue you from your participation in this construal of sin that's preventing my humanity from being the Imago Day. So allow me to save you as yeah. well. Yeah. In a sense, if that makes Thank sense. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Harris. Tamisha. Yes, I um I guess I'm an aspiring professional theologian because y'all don't pay me yet. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think for me, I, I didn't get to the point of thank you, by the way, that was brilliant. And I look forward to delving into this even more. Um, I, I think for me, in engaging with the book and with the talk tonight, I didn't get to the theological point because I was so busy going, wow, that's that's my experience. Um, my experience as a student, and I, I'll say that because I, um, I've i been to three different institutions now. I started at the community college level, went to the state college level, and I've done my graduate work in seminary. And have done some form of resistance or protest at each of those institutions. And I've always thought about um, several layers. One, what does it mean to be an activist or a person of resistance not necessarily always being on the street? Does that, is, is, is my activism on a college campus valid, number one? Um, number two, I know I'm not doing this in a vacuum. This had to have come somewhere. So hearing about, um, people generations before me doing some of some variation of the exact same things for the exact same reasons um, is both incredibly resonant and validating and also just as heartbreaking. Because the same things that you're reading in the book about curriculum and wanting more black students and having centers and all those different things are the same exact stories. We could probably read some of those quotes and not give a name or a date and say, well, so-and-so just said that two months ago. Um, and so that's the heartbreaking part of it. Um, the validating and the encouraging part of it is that the reality is stepping into an act of resistance, pushing back and asserting oneself and saying, I am meant to be here, and so you will make room for me, um, especially to a place that you know was not created for you. Um, there is something incredibly validating about that on a college campus because of the way in which at all of these different levels, the future leaders are shaped. Leaders and the people who make all these decisions also are not made in a vacuum. Right, so where right. do they come from? Right. How are they shaped? How are the ideologies and the thoughts that they produce to the masses created? They come from somewhere. Yeah. Um, and so to be able to say that the time spent um, in these Ivy League institutions, the time spent at the state schools, the time spent in those acts of resistance are not forgotten, um, and they, they weren't for nothing. Um, I was a black studies major at Cal State Long Beach, and I studied under Dr. Uh, Muhammad Karenga, who, for those of you who don't know, invented Kwanzaa. So when you celebrate Kwanzaa, you can thank my undergraduate advisor. Um, but I would not be a black studies major if it had not been for those protests and those resistance at those institutions. And we don't always talk about that. And we don't always talk about the ways in which and the levels of intelligence and the access and the privilege of the people. I think you were right, Dr. Brackley, to say that a lot of the times when we're thinking about people of resistance, we do use the sharecropper image or the these people are coming from really hard places and rough time. They don't have access and they want access. And it's like, no, when you have the most access, yeah. according to what's on paper, we still have a problem. Um, and what does that mean that we still have to think about 
how we are going to live and survive in a place that on paper we have arrived in some sort of way. Right, right. Um, and what does it mean that you then still have to push beyond that when you made it to the finish line and you're still running? Yeah. Um, yeah. So it was deeply resonant with me, heartbreaking. Um, I'm sure there are so many different theological things we can go, but um, <laughs> when I reached the level of professional. Yes, 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 <laughs> yes, yes. I will let you know. And, and I think one of the things that Tamisha brings out that was highlighted in the book is this understanding that um, there was this diversity within the black power movement that you did not have to be, quote unquote, a poor black kid from the slums in order to be participating and to be an active participant in the black power movement, that there was such a diversity of experiences, of backgrounds, of socioeconomic background and access, that there were people that participated at so many different levels that actually made the movement what the movement was. Yeah, beautiful. Dr. Calloway. Uh, yeah, thank you for the book, for your lecture. Um, just taking notes on how to lecture out of a book. That was, that was quite brilliant. <laughs> um, I, was, I was fascinated. Uh, I, <clears throat> I should probably say w why I'm on this panel. Um, and I think, Dwight, you can tell me. <laughs> I think it's because I've pretty uh, out in the open failed. In a, in a number of ways. And uh, my daughters and I, we, I, I you know, say this thing about like, we have this chant and I go, what's the key to learning? And we all cheer, failure. <laughs> and <clears throat> and that's, that's fine as far as it goes until you actually are failing and that's really difficult. Um, yeah, and it's embarrassing and yes. it's public, it's humiliating. And, and there's certain failures that you, you feel like, um, okay, maybe I don't have a capacity that I wasn't equipped, that's okay, but Certain things you go, I, I should have seen, I should have known, I should have, I should have been able to 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 pierce through sort of the numbness and and um, the callousness that I was handed, and and I failed so many times as an educator um, at a place like Fuller that I have jokingly <laughs> referred to as, or I would often say, you know, people like to think of Fuller as the the Princeton Seminary of the West, and I go, no, 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 Princeton is the Fuller of the East, right? So. <clears throat> Um, I've, I've, I've long lauded Fuller as sort of, you know, an Ivy League seminary, right? Uh, but, but we don't wear ties. That's the only difference, you know, we're on the, on the, on the, South, uh, on the uh, West Coast. Um, and yet, uh, as Tamish was saying, we, as an institution, um, as faculty, as students, we struggle with uh, many of the exact same things that you're outlining here that are 50 and 100 and 150 and 250 years old. Added to that, um, I have inherited a, a religious tradition in the United States that I'm, I'm now just convinced is not just implicated in the racial injustice that we encounter each day, that Tamish is describing in her experience, that you describe in your book. Um, we are in many ways the champions of it. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, and, and that is a difficult thing to reckon with. It's, it's one thing to say, I've, I've inherited and I operate within an institution that, that is structured along racist lines. It's another thing to say the entire project from its beginning um, was poisoned. I say all that to say, <clears throat> as, I, as I read this text, what I find encouraging, what I find hopeful, um, and then just biographically, Tamisha has been a student of mine as well. And um, I, in those failures, in those ways that um, I as, as individual, as an educator, as a scholar, et cetera, as a person of faith, um, have not seen when I should have seen. Uh, I have been blessed to have, um, as you said at the beginning, this isn't a story about institutions making these students better, it's students making institutions better. For some reason, and I, I think this is, moves into the realm of the miraculous, uh, a person like Tamisha didn't write me off. Um, a person like Tamisha said, okay, <laughs> you're messed up. Uh, <laughs> it's very clear. <laughs> um, but, by, <laughs> Tamisha. <laughs> yeah, but genuinely by the grace of God, I'm yeah. committed to, to you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, now, is this partly of, of, of Tamisha going because I'm advocating for others who will come in my way? Well, yes, but I can't ever eliminate or, or get rid of the fact that I think it also had to do with her saying, I care about you yeah. 
my faculty, who should be my mentor, who should be my leader, who needs me to lead from below, who needs me to, to call uh, uh, you know, truth to power um, and, and open eyes that are blinded. And so in that sense, I, I, I feel like I both am fine to talk about this at the same time, feel like what's been handed to me is, is a gift, um, not something I've been able to proactively take responsibility for. Um, and so that's what, as I, as I read your, your text, just time and time again, that was the theme that I kept coming to is thank God for these students. Um, thank God for their, uh, their indefatigable spirit um, and looking at a, a, an environment that would have just discouraged and defeated me and, and saying no um, and tapping into that spirit, I think, that, that you're getting at. Um, in, in your defense, I think that what you've shared is exactly why you're here. Um, this panel is, is constructed not just for a visual diversity. It is, it is a diversity of experience and status. Um, and I think it's important uh, as you talk about, you know, not just that this portion of the project might be problem, problematic, that the entire pro, uh, project might be problematic from its, in, from its initiation. Um, as we are um, celebrating and honoring uh, Dr. King, uh, there's this initial thought from Dr. King that the issue is race, that race is the issue, that's it. And, and then we get years later that King says, we are now experiencing the coming to the surface of a triple pronged sickness that has been lurking within our body politic from its very beginning. That is the sickness of racism, comma, excessive materialism, comma, and militarism. Yeah, um, so it is, it is, I think the journey that you've just expressed is, is, is a journey that many of us are on, have been on, that we think that we have our finger on the pulse of what the issue is, and as we get in closer and do the hard work of asking those questions and sitting in those spaces, we begin to find the problems much deeper than that. Um, Dr. Bradley, I want to give you a moment to respond to what you've heard, and then I want you to speak on something that you share with me. <laughs> well... Uh, first of all, this is, uh, I don't know if you'll ever get a chance to do this. This is one of the most humbling things like to, you know, I get reviews, <laughs> but I don't ever have to see the people. Yeah. And, yeah. I, and so this is very humbling and flattering. Uh, and, and, uh, I appreciate that you all took the time to, to, to dig into and reflect on my work. I, you're correct in saying I didn't write for theologians in, in particular, but I'm glad that you were able to make meaning out of this. And the points that you brought up, you're precisely right. That was the spirit. That was the spirit of, 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 of what they were doing. And, and so uh, to me, that uh, it touches my heart that you're able to, to extract that from the work uh, and to, to see it. Uh, in a in a in a different way from a different angle and that that, that means the world to me and uh, and um, sister to me like I, I wish it was better for you yeah. I wish we had defeated it I wish we had had gotten it before you had to go through it and that's from the bottom of my heart the idea is this these these students they we all protested for, we all uh, resisted and rebelled for people we, we wouldn't know. I didn't know you were coming along. Mm -hmm. yeah. And if I'd have known it was you, maybe I should have gone harder. Maybe I should have spent more time at it. This is the idea of King, for real. He only had one job, and that's running either Dexter Avenue Baptist Church or Ebenezer. That was his one job. Yeah. But he did so much more, and I should... I think we all should have done so much more, so much more. And so, so when you said it's a beautiful thing, but also a, a hurtful thing, oh man, that was powerful. That was powerful. And this idea, uh, Professor, this idea that, that um, 50 years ago, 100 years ago, 150 years ago, uh, they had the same problems that it's baked into the foundations of it. I, I love that so much because we love to think that white supremacy looks like uh, people in pointy hats. Mm -hmm. 
We love to think that. But when you go to Columbia University's campus and you go to, 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 to Butler Library, on the library, it's beautiful. Oh, it's, it's gorgeous. At the top of the library, uh, Brother Reverend, it reads Cicero, Aristotle, Plato, Homer. I'm like, man, those boys was jamming back then. They were jamming. You can walk all around campus and not see a black thing anywhere. That, to me, tells me that somebody's culture is supreme. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not saying that these boys weren't bad, because they were. They were cold. <laughs> when you read these things, like it's, it's remarkable. But do you mean to tell me that there were no black people, no Africans, that there were no people from the continent of Asia or Latin America? That this is how supremacy works. That there's a requirement in your college curriculum that you take these courses, but never have to learn about a certain group of people. That's what supremacy looks like. That's what supremacy looks like. So, so to me, this has been wonderful. I think one of the things that we always have to remember is that uh, I valorize, I'm guilty of this, I valorize in a way this uh, activism, this activism, and a certain kind of act activism, and I'm guilty of that. But one of the things I learned in writing this book is that it takes tree shakers and jelly makers. Mm. Yep. Y'all write that down. That's good. Y'all write that down. Silly. Uh, <laughs> no, sir. That's good preaching. <laughs> tree shakers and jelly makers. You need somebody that's willing to take over a campus building. You need that. In part, to unsettle everybody. Because I need you to pay attention to what's happening right now. Period. Right now. I need you to pay attention. But after that's over... Here comes the, and forgive me for saying this in the seminary, here comes the unsexy part. <laughs> Who's going to sit on the curriculum committee? It's good. Who's going who's gonna to sit on the programming committee? Who's going to be on the search committee? That's the work. Let me tell you, I was in the street. I ran from the tear gas. I ran from the armored personnel vehicles. That's exhilarating a certain kind of exhilaration that you'll never, ever feel. But who's going to be around to make sure that the Boeing company invests in youth on the front end so that buildings don't get burned out and, and windows don't get broken on yeah. the back end? Yeah. You need somebody there, the jelly makers there, yeah. to do that work. As much as you need people on the street, to shake things up, you need people to, 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 to take care of the, the, the business in a way. Yeah. And, and everybody has a role in that. Yeah. Everybody, including faculty, including faculty, including administrators. One of the things I didn't get to talk about was the fact that these administrators, some, uh, some of these administrators, some of these faculty members had these students in their homes feeding these students. One of, one of the, the, the black professors at, uh, uh, at Harvard University, at Harvard University, Martin Kilson, he, he recently died, not too, too long ago. They called him a stone contrarian. That is, whatever idea you had, he could find a way to argue against it. <laughs> he didn't believe in all of this uh, taking over campus buildings. He didn't believe in all of this. Yeah. You know, he, the students say, we want black studies. He said, why? <laughs> and he made you he made you dig down and figure out it precisely why there's a need for black studies. Hmm. And even though he was contrarian in that way, he said, okay, now come on over, I'm a cook for you. <laughs> that to me is another part of movement making. That's another part of it. And so to me, that's why I say these, uh, these, these jelly makers are just as important as the, as the tree shakers. Black students like uh, Tamisha, some became super seniors. I don't know if you know that term. Uh, but they spent an extra year trying to ensure that there would be a curriculum in place yeah. 
that still stands to this day that that hired people like Skip Gates and and, and those kinds of people. So yeah, I'd love to to hear from 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 our panel just um, however you, you you want to frame it. But what having experienced or having read some of the some of the book and having heard the lecture, what are the things that you see are now? Let's take the work from its historic context and place it actually on the boots on the ground today. What are some of the implications for students right now, whether we're talking about tree shakers or, or jelly makers? I'm taking that home. I'm going to preach that. Um, that's going to show up in a sermon soon. Um, but whether it's, it's fostering and um, not trying to quench activism, whether it's, it's doing the jelly making of curriculum, curricular changes, what are the what are the things that we can take away now and say these are things we need to be looking at right now? These are things that we need to be engaging right now. Or these are things that I can see how this applies right now, and these are the ramifications of that. Um, are you lecturing from the book? Well, I, I'm going to try. <laughs> uh, I underlined it was in the uh, uh, the brown section. Um, I, it was like almost a perfect answer to your question. And I, oh, oh here we go. Um, page 99. Uh, it, this, this stuck out to me in part because uh, Brown, as I understand it from, from your book, um, is one of the most sort of paradoxical examples and in, in, in how implicated it was um, in, in it literally being erected by slaves. <laughs> and then at the same time, making space for the, these students. And so I thought, I thought that was a really interesting example. Um, and here you say the first phase uh, required the institution to get beyond its liberal rhetoric and actually increase the number of black people on campus. Okay, so that's the goal. Um, and so I, I underline that. Number one, step one, get more black people on campus. <laughs> it's a very practical goal. Yeah. Step two, um, that involved making resources available to a group of people, black students, who are essentially strangers to institutional white America. Um, to me, that it, there's two things in there. One, it's, a, it's an actual resource, material resource thing, but, but not just throwing money at something. It's, it's, it's resourcing people knowing that they are, they are not only strangers in a strange land now, but they're coming to a strange land. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and we have to resource them in a way that accounts for that. Yeah. Um, and then the third thing is uh, the funding of student organizations, curricular enhancement, and a space for the students. So something that says, and, and I'm right now doing some research in, in, in psychology and trauma studies, and I didn't know this coming into it, um, but I've been really struck by, with our own uh, student protests here at Fuller and in and, and, and hearing from specifically African-American students, um, the level of, from microaggressions and all these other things, the trauma that they simply bring to the doorstep. Before Fuller, as an institution, does anything or says anything, um, there is a level of trauma that as an institution, as faculty, we, I would say, don't account for. Um, and there's something about the resourcing and providing space for students that says, um, to your point of, of simply being safe, right? And that entails um, accounting in real ways for the history of trauma um, that they're bringing to the doorstep, similar to you would account for a veteran of Afghanistan or Iraq who came to study, you know, it, it, exactly the same way. Um, and you wouldn't simply say, well, ah, here's some scholarship money, good luck, right? Yeah, um, yeah. So it's something like those, those three points I thought were really stuck out to me as practical uh, steps that you could implement on mm -hmm. the ground. And, and, and Dr. Bradley said it several times uh, scattered and seasoned throughout the lecture, but in the midst of that, they still had to make grades. Yeah. It, it, it was a refrain that in the midst of you coming in with more trauma than, than the next five students, you still have to make grades. That, that in the face of the microaggressions, still make grades. In the face of, of overt or, or covert racism, um, you still have a paper due in week 10. Uh, you know, it's, it doesn't stop. So the grind of, of the academia doesn't stop even though the burden, whether we're talking about trauma or whether we're talking about the burden of, of activism, that burden just adds to everything else, but still make grades, yeah. You know, I, I, I made a comment, whether it was funny or not, I don't know, but I, I made a comment about being a professional theologian, and there was something behind that. Um, I grew up, 
just after Martin Luther King was assassinated. So I, I grew up, he, I was only about five years old. So I, I didn't know the, the, the full dimensions of it, but because of that, I was part of the desegregation program. So I was, I was bust. Yeah. So I spent my junior high and high school years in predominantly white space. Yes. But during those six years, I always felt like a visitor. That space never was made for me. And so those six years was definitely, I was not, you know, this was not my school. This was not because I'm 20, 30 miles away from my home. Yeah. So the culture doesn't reflect me. Yeah. The teachers definitely do not reflect me. Yeah. The students don't reflect yeah. me. Everything, even we were in the marching band. And I can say this now, hope I don't get in trouble. You all right. But <laughs> I can say this now, but there was one thing, and I was in the marching band all my, all my three years in high school. There was one thing I used to dread when we had to play, our teams play a black school. Yep. Used to dread it because I knew what music we were going to play. <laughs> and it wasn't going to be nothing like what they were playing at Locke and at Jordan and at Crenshaw. Yeah, yeah. And it was embarrassing yeah. because we would come out playing Barry Manilow <laughs> and they were playing what was hot at the time. Playing Prince. <laughs> yeah, and so it was embarrassing. But any other time I was okay. Yeah. But then get to higher education, yes. and then I'm reliving it again. Yeah. So you're reliving, you're the only black face in the classroom, and everyone knows you, who you are. Everyone knows who you are, and I'm thinking, why do you know me? I never said one word in the classroom. Oh, yeah. I'm the only black guy here. Yeah, you know, so I'm the other. So, yeah, yeah. so that, again, makes you feel this is not my space. Yeah. So if I ask what is one of the things that I, our, our institutes of higher learning should do now and we should fight for is these spaces have to reflect us sometimes. Yeah. Some of the space should be reflect who we are, reflect, um, um, like you said, there, there has to be some black author that can now have his face on the side of the wall somewhere or in the curriculum. Yeah. So I think uh, uh, of that would, would help. Um, I always kind of joke um, um, around with, with I, I was going to say something, I changed my mind. But um, I always joke that, okay, I'll give you. No, black community, we maybe, we haven't been the best in economics. I'll get you that. Okay, maybe we haven't been the best in, uh, you name it, uh, building or engineering architecture. But there's one thing we've done very well is music. We've done well in gospel music, and we can't have our music on a regular rotation. Mm. Regular rotation in our coffee shops, in our coffee shops on campus, if nothing else. Now, I say that very facetiously, trust me, yeah. to make a point. Yeah. But somehow, are, are we have to reshape our campuses to reflect so we can feel that it is part of who we are, and they want us here on a permanent basis. Yeah. And so that, that, for me, is one of the things I would really... Yeah, and I think that I share your experience living in South Central, um, being bused to Palisades High School. Where, where'd you grow up in South Central? Uh, mom, y'all record? My mom was down. Oh, uh, I, was, I was Vermont. Major. Yes, sir! <laughs> <laughs> sorry, we had a moment, sorry. Uh, <laughs> and, and being bused out, I, I felt the same thing. In those spaces, you always felt as a visitor um, in those spaces. And, and so if I can throw a shameless commercial here. Um, so when we celebrated our 50th anniversary of the School of Intercultural Studies, um, and I've shared this publicly before, um, we went to celebrate and we were putting up faces of all of the professors that have ever been full professor, full-time professors at, at, in the School of Intercultural Studies. And here I am, a PhD student in SIS, and I'm looking, and I'm looking, and I'm looking, and I'm still looking, and thank God for Dr. G who Hansel's, but, but I'm looking and I never saw anyone that looked like me. So as much as this was a moment of celebration, it felt very alienating, alienating and isolating in that moment that it was almost reinforced that this space didn't feel like it was for you. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think the thing now I would say, um, I don't have a green thumb. I'm terrible with plants. Please don't give me um, things of nature. I will um, accidentally kill them. But uh, I think I'm wise enough to know that you can only prune branches so long before you realize that the problem is at the root. And I think this is a comment more generally about history, 
in us understanding the importance of history as we think about how to move ahead. And I think that what we've seen here um, and what we've heard here tonight is that this is not a new thing. And it's not just like, oh, okay, a couple generations that it work itself out. No, it was embedded in the actual construction of these institutions. Um, we've also know, we've also heard tonight that even some of the successes and some of the wins weren't materialized until after the people who got those wins left those institutions. Now that means very particular things as you're thinking about planning. It means that number one, you're not fighting a new enemy. This is not a new thing that you're fighting. So when you know institutions and some of the most liberal institutions will come and will say, oh, you know, we've, you know, yes, we agree with you as if this has been something that has been on their minds for years and years and years. The reality is it's in the root. So it's not a branch that they can cut off and agree and put money toward, da, 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 da. there's something deeper going on. Secondly, it means that every win, everything that you're doing or things that you yourself will not see. You may not see, it is for the people who are coming after you. So how then does that shape the way in which you think about approaching protest, activism, change? Um, so I think that understanding history is extremely important. Um, so I encourage you all, this is not a shameless plug for your book, but I encourage you all to read the book, yeah. especially if you have- Which, yeah. which is Here available for Fuller students any? as an electronic book in the library. Yes, yeah, so there you go. Um, if you have any kind of investment in understanding how to make an institution better, which I do, then you should read the book. You should see the history of what has happened because the history of what has happened at these Ivy League institutions, which we've heard tonight has, were institutions before the country, the more that we can understand what is really at stake for what we're doing. Um, the other thing I will say, and I, I, I would be a terrible PhD candidate if I didn't reference part of who I'm studying for my dissertation. Um, in one of her novels, Octavia Butler writes about a uh, the world has basically ended. Humans have killed themselves in war. There's only few humans left. An alien species comes to the planet and gathers all of those humans. Um, rehabilitates them and then starts to rehabilitate the earth to send those humans back to whatever this new earth is created. The black woman that is the main character of that novel is in a conversation with uh, one of the people from the alien species and the thing that they say, we have been watching humans for a very long time. We've been observing everything that you do and we can tell you that the reason that your species is extinct is because, and this is the number one reason they said, they said, hierarchy is what killed you. Hierarchy, you had to make hierarchy and supremacy out of everything. And that is the thing that ended you as a species. And so as they're rehabilitating them, they're having to think differently as if hierarchy didn't exist. And so I think that when we go into these walls and we see these names and we see uh, white supremacy at play, we see the lack of representation, we see all of these things that are missing in curriculum, we have to think about how we are complicit in that hierarchy. What it is that we're really saying, we're taught, especially in seminary, that you can go into a church and know everything about the theology of that church without that church telling you anything about their theology, simply by the way they order their service. Is it centered on the sermon? Where's the table? Is there a table? Do they do this? Do they do that? Is it in the round? Is there this big old stage where people look down? Do the people are allowed to touch the priest? All of that speaks. But we are taught that we are crazy if we can come into an institution and say, why don't we have any black faculty? Why are we reading this on a curriculum? You're saying something, whether you're saying it or not. And so I think that hearing these stories and hearing these testimonies of what has been happening and some of the struggles and the, and, the, and the challenges and the victories of that can teach us a lot about um, how we can play and that it is in fact a long game that we are playing. Yeah. Can, oh. Go ahead and then we're um, gonna take a few questions. Oh, questions. Uh, I mean, just to add, yes and to that um, and to the the comment about the spirit or sort of a pneumatology or, or, or these students sort of tapping into a, a spiritual sense. Um, I've been really impressed lately of a number of 
it's <laughs> a lot of, Tamisha's got me reading Afrofuturism as opposed to all the Afro-pessimism I was reading. Um, I think she saw me last summer and she's like, oh, Cutter, you need, you need a <laughs> left and like, it's, <laughs> anyway, um, but amongst all the, the sort of Afro-pessimist literature I was reading, a, a Calvin Warren, a Christina Sharp, Joseph Sorat, none of whom are, uh, are invested in theological projects per se, but all of whom start invoking specifically and explicitly sometimes language of the spirit. Um, and I, uh, you know, uh, I don't know Calvin personally, but a couple others have like, uh, I'm like, I, I want to ask him, am I reading into this as a theologian saying you're doing, and there, I, a friend said, no, no, you, on good word, he's doing it. And I'm, and I'm like, this is fascinating. Um, in part, because I think it's, it's a possible avenue of, if we acknowledge the, the branch, the tree metaphor, or whatever, um, the root is the problem, the soil, um, there's something, uh, something there, something active and, and energizing and, powerful about sort of this uh, giving in to the movement of the spirit, however, capital S, lowercase s, whatever. Um, and it, it calls to mind that, you know, back in the day I used this metaphor of, of the human spirit and God's spirit, Ruach and Hevel intermixing. Anyway, and so I, you know, wax eloquently on this. And it's only recently in this sort of context that I go, oh, I think that's what I meant <laughs> with this metaphor. And saying that when, when the spirit, the divine spirit, comes into contact with a, a sort of less substantive spirit, it's both the, the animating force of all, all living breath, so it, it gives us energy to protest, to, to do whatever, um, but it also is a, uh, a disruptive force. It's inherently disruptive. You, you, there's no sort of animation of particles without disruption. And then finally, it's a dispersing sort of reality. What I find interesting about that is if that's how we think about the spiritual sort of thread of this text, of, of what's going on at, in, at the Ivy uh, League um, in all of higher education, um, inherent to that is disruption, is displacement. However, depending upon your position, that disruption is experienced very differently, right? Um, and I have been told my whole life that to tap into the spirit or whatever is actually not about disruption. It's about solidarity and, and, and consistency or whatever. Um, and so part of the task, I think, is not just identifying where's the spirit moving, but allowing the disruption to happen um, and seeing it as constructive, to see it as sometimes the tree just needs to die and be reborn. Um, and so that's both uh, sort of uh, uh, scattered, but at the same time, m my sort of source of hope, I think. Um, and that's why I really loved your comments on, on the sort of pneumatological thrust of, of this whole project. Just uh, real quickly, along those lines, of, of, of this disruption, uh, I forgot to mention that, that Princeton Theological Seminary just... The just, Fuller of the East? Uh, oh, yes. Uh, yes, yeah, yeah, the that, Fuller yeah. of the East <laughs> just announced that it would be situating $27 million towards, uh, towards reparations for uh, its affiliation with slavery. Um, at Brown University, of course, they had a you know a slavery center and a study uh, uh, a center for the study of slavery and and that sort of thing. Uh, but also at these institutions, because of disruption, because of these very things, you have a Toni Morrison Hall now mm -hmm. at at Princeton University. Nobody was thinking that before students disrupted. disrupted in that way. And, and I think that that's important that we recognize that and try to figure out what it all means, like to, to, to how do you move forward? What's a good step? Uh, saying I'm sorry is, is a good start. Start, start, start. Chris has um, one question that uh, he's gonna read from online and then we'll have time for maybe, maybe one, one or two questions before we summarize several. Um, this one's kind of a big question, but hopefully it's a good summary. Um, how do you envision the disruption of institutions today, uh, the upending of it? Is there any other way of bringing change beyond disruption and upending, or is it necessary to have that occur for the change to happen, especially in light of the idea of the root being corrupt, the whole thing being poisoned, and so on like that? I want to answer that so bad. I say you should. Yeah. It's very, no. <laughs> That's the answer. If the question is, is there another way? No. Power is, is, is never conceded. It has to be disrupted. It has to be shaken. And what that disruption looks like, I think the core of the question is probably better for us to maybe elaborate upon. 
what does the core of that disruption look like, but I think that it's been clear and evidenced not just through the historical record that Dr. Bradley has presented to us this evening, but just in our own experiences in life, that, that it does take disruption for us to re reach a new plant, a new norm, a more vibrant uh, image of the kingdom of God, um, a more full, fuller <laughs> the theology. Um, it takes disruption. Uh, that would be my short answer. I'm sorry, I'm yeah, not on the no, panel. No, I agree. I think there's a um, there's there's part of that question that I think I hear a lot of like, are there other ways besides going out and putting your body on the line that we can cause disruption? And the answer is maybe, but th there's nothing like putting your body on. They won't like. Social media has been a huge tool for people just think about, you know, Black Lives Matter, all these different things, has been a huge tool for helping to bring awareness, helping to disrupt some things. Um, but having people sit in a space, walk into a space, physically disrupt a space, I think is always going to be important. There's something always important about what we do with our bodies. And I think that a lot of times we think that just typing something out hands wash, we've done the thing, check mark, we can move on. And I think that there's something about a physical disruption, there's something about um, being actually present in that way that changes what that means, that changes that shift in that power dynamic even. Um, I think things that are probably happening now, I think there are probably students who are going, well, I'm not gonna come there. There's economic disruption. I'm gonna walk out and stop giving my money to that thing. I'm gonna go somewhere else and I'm gonna make it publicly known that I'm going somewhere else, that I'm taking my money somewhere else. Um, but that's not new either. That's the whole thing behind the bus boycott. I'm not gonna put my money into this system. I will walk, I will put my body and my legs on the sidewalk for weeks and not put my money into the system until you do right by me. That's not a new thing. And so I think that the ways in which we think and we could be creative in about how we approach those things. And for some people, that means, you know, starting their own institutions or, or, or collaborating with other people who are doing the right thing. For people who are in particular institutions, it's saying, no, this is the thing that I want to do. This is the thing that I want to study. This is the thing that I want to pursue. And I think that there's value in that. Um, so, yeah, I think that there are some creative ways that we can kind of lean into it. I don't know... If new is the right word. Yeah. And I think that let's let's just bring the conversation away from the, the ethereal and theoretical, and let's just put it right on the ground, that having shaken fruit here on this campus, mm -hmm. I think the one thing that we're, as an institution, and again, I'm speaking to, I, I want to highlight the diversity on this panel, not the physical, visual di diversity, but the fact that there are administrators, there are faculty members, there are students, um, that there's a diversity here. And I think one of the things that we don't do well as an institution is actually talk about the jelly making. Mm -hmm. um, that there are things that are being done as a result of the tree being shaken. But, but oftentimes we don't talk enough about the jelly making because the jelly making also brings with it a level of guilt also brings with it a level of, of confession that we don't like to deal with. So um, I think that just loving this analogy that yes, we put our bodies on the line um, and yes, disruption is necessary, but then after that disruption, the, the excitement, and I think Dr. Bradley was mentioning, you know, the thrill of, uh, or the, even just the, the, the rush of running through the street with the smell of tear gas um, is nowhere near as exhilarating as sitting in a search committee. It just doesn't compare, at least for me. Uh, but, but that process of, of, of the making of the, of the policies and the procedures becomes just as important as the fact that things have been shaken up. And I think that if we talk about both or if we publicize both as much, um, I think that it allows people not to experience this this complete battle fatigue, because that's a real thing as well. Um, is there one more? We, that was an online question. Do we have maybe one, one or two questions from the audience? Um, yes, come on, just come to the mic so we can hear you. 
Okay. So I appreciate your mentioning um, how different people have different roles in this grander movement. Um, and I know you spoke to that more historically, and I would really appreciate if you and the other panelists would speak to presently, how do you envision or how do you believe Black students and alumni of these institutions play a role in current Black power movements uh, that we're living in right now? Uh, thank you for your question, and uh, thank you for your work. Um, I am very happy that you mentioned alumni. What a powerful position to be in yeah. uh, as, as, as an alumnus of an institution or an alumna of an institution. The ability to call back and, 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 and write back and to pressure your institution to, to do what you know it, it could do is a powerful thing. It's a very powerful thing. I think when you talk about everybody has a, a, a role uh, and in this current moment, what does that mean? I think the first thing I tell students, and and they they always get mad at me because students, you know, they say, "Well, how can I be an activist? What, you know, I want to be an activist. How do I do that?" Well, you have to read. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody likes the answer. Yeah. You have to read. If you tell me that you don't like uh, uh, capitalism, then read Das Kapital. If you tell me that you you have a problem uh, you have a problem with 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 uh, um, uh, these various things, then you're going to have to do well to understand colonialism and imperialism and to understand intersectionality and to understand patriarchy. You have to read to show yourself, to study to show yourself worthy, right? Like so, that's a first step, and so this is an important step as well because because um, some of these things are wildly predictable. Responses of institutions are wildly predictable. If you read, you don't have to be surprised every time. Yeah, yeah. And so I think that's, 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 that's an early part of the whole thing. The other thing is, it's a practice. It's a practice to resist. It's, 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 not, it's not natural to most of us. Most of us will see an escalator that's been broke for a year and just walk up and down it without ever thinking, like, shouldn't I call somebody to do this? In our neighborhoods, we see the same yeah. broken down car for a decade. Yeah. And we never think, like, should, let's just push the car out in, into the inter intersection. <laughs> and I bet somebody will come and get it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but that you have to train your mind to be able to do that. And for, especially for black people who have been trained to suffer in silence. Yeah. We have to be able to say, ouch, but not just make it about our own suffering, but make it, and this is, this is my final point on this. What inspired me about 2013, 14, 15, 16 to this present moment was that young people started speaking in terms of we again. Yeah. Not the French word, but... <laughs> <laughs> but we, yeah. I, I, I've been teaching a long time, yeah. and I became a finance major because I want to be rich. But when this happened, they thought, we need to have a voice. We need this for our community. And so to me, when you can get to the point of, and this is how black studies starts, this is black psychology, black, you know, black theology, we, us, I, we, you see. We, us, I, if we does well, it's good for us, and I will do well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Listen, I want to honor our, our time uh, tonight. Uh, would you help me in just appreciating Dr. Bradley, Dr. Harris, Tamisha Tyler, and Dr. Calloway?